Do you remember Flappy Bird? Flappy Bird took over the world in 2013. It was a casual mobile game originally for iOS, one of those single-button games where you just tap the screen and the game plays on rails. It was notoriously shit, meaning also it was notoriously difficult to play, and it was the first game I remember where you could quickly and seamlessly share your score onto social media. The difficulty made you want to gloat, and the share button was right there on the game over screen. It was brilliant. Anyway, that shitty little shit made $50,000 off in-game advertisements. Every day. So, why? Was it the addictive nature of a single-button game? Maybe. Was it the intrinsic free advertisement of the share button? Maybe. Was it the fact that PewDiePie reviewed it? Probably. But I have a different theory. I think it's because of that. Intellectual property, also known as IP, is incomprehensibly powerful. The sheer gravitational pull created by a recognizable character or icon can rewire our brains with a drip feed of familiarity and nostalgia. I should know, I have plenty of them tattooed on my arm. Here's an example, and be honest. If you went to a party and someone asked if you wanted to play a racing game, like Forza or whatever, would you say yes? Now what if the racing game was Mario Kart? That's the power of a good IP. On September 18th, Nintendo and the Pokemon Company announced they would be taking legal action against PocketPair, the Japanese company behind Pal World. We all have feelings about this. We all have questions and concerns. A lot of commenters have a lot of comments about how trademark is different than copyright, and how patent law works differently in Japan, and all that fun internet shit. But none of that matters, because we're not lawyers. What matters is that we take a step back, we take a breath in, and we take a moment to admit to ourselves and each other that although Pal World is a fun game with interesting crafting mechanics and an attractive art style, the only reason any of us played it is because it was Pokemon. With guns. IP matters. Let's not pretend they don't. Whether it's characters, designs, names, game mechanics, or whatever the hell else. And it is the duty of capitalist megastructures like Nintendo, and PocketPair for that matter, to protect and defend their IP. Sometimes that sucks for the consumer. And sometimes it doesn't. But that's just the way of things. So while we wait to see whether PocketPair will be punished for the crime of finally giving us that open-world Pokemon game we've been begging Nintendo for for decades, let's take a moment to appreciate how all this started, and how many court cases it took to get us where we are today. Because Nintendo was not always like this. This is learned behavior. A final disclaimer for this video. I'm attempting to cover every Nintendo lawsuit but I will inevitably fail, either because information online is scarce or because the parties involved had to sign an NDA. But damn it, I've done my best. Hello, I'm Hawkwood, and I also don't know what I'm talking about. Believe it or not, Nintendo hasn't always been the rules lawyer bringing down the ban hammer against the little guy in order to protect their IP. In fact, in their first case, they were the little guy. We've all had the thought, why do Donkey Kong and King Kong have the same name? And they're both gorillas who kidnap ladies 
and climb up tall shit. Isn't that like a blatant, unimaginative ripoff? And yes, it is. It's a blatant, unimaginative ripoff perpetuated by one Shigeru Miyamoto in 1981. Universal Studios, who owned the U.S. copyright for the Japanese movie King Kong vs. Godzilla, sued Nintendo for obvious reasons. But hilariously, it didn't go so well for them. The court found that the King Kong copyright was actually owned in different ways by three separate parties, and Universal wasn't any of them. In fact, the name and the character were now public domain, a fact that Universal should have known, since... They had argued that fact themselves when they got sued by the original owner, the Dicks. So, Nintendo was officially introduced to the American legal system with a win by default. Quite the villain origin story, if you ask me, which you should not. Again, I am not a lawyer. After the video game crash of 1983, Nintendo cautiously entered the console gaming market in America by guaranteeing that, unlike the like of Atari, their games met a stringent set of quality standards. This was handled by a lockout chip, called the 10NES, which would prevent third-party games from running on the NES hardware. If you played a game on Nintendo, it was made by Nintendo. Now, Atari didn't care too much for that because Nintendos were in the homes of about 30% of Americans at this point, and Atari wanted to sell games for all those consoles. So they went the corporate espionage route, like you do. They decided to reverse engineer the chip so they could bypass it altogether. When that didn't work, they resorted to the more interesting method and straight up stole it. For some reason that I literally cannot understand, this success was not enough for Atari, so they also sued Nintendo for unfair competition for making the chip in the first place. Nintendo replied by telling them, no, you, and countersued, not only for unfair competition, but also for the whole theft thing. Unfortunately for Atari, they lost both cases, but only because they stole the code for the lockout chip. If they hadn't, then the court would have ruled in their favor since the court decided that reverse engineering is considered fair use. Somehow. Now on to the good stuff. Once upon a time in America and Japan, you could rent music and software the same way you can rent movies and games today. Music and software companies didn't like that so much. What a surprise. So, lobbyists did what lobbyists do, with what I presume was a lot of dark money, and convinced Congress to stop letting that happen. Nintendo wanted them to stop game rentals as well, but the Video Software Dealers Association, which was a group of a thousand retail companies in the U.S. and Canada, told them to fuck off because video game rentals made bank. One such bank maker was Blockbuster, that video rental store from Captain Marvel and The Last Action Hero. In 1989, it was so omnipresent that a new store was opening up somewhere every day. They were making over $600 million a year by renting VHS tapes and, by this time, quite a lot of games. They were even nice about it, making photocopies of the manuals to include in each rental so us little gamers got the full experience of not being poor for at least five days at a time. Since Congress wasn't going to do anything about that blockbuster selling games thing, Nintendo decided to get petty and take them to court over the photocopying. Turns out that technically did break the copyright of the game manuals, even though who gives a shit. Blockbuster settled out of court and promised to stop photocopying materials. Instead, they just bought copies. Hollow win for Nintendo. Here's a quote for you. 
The issue is so complex that even Nintendo suffered from confusion over the elements throughout the history of this litigation. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen and other, welcome to patent law. It goes something like this. Ralph Bayer is this awesome guy who imagined playing games on a television way before anyone else did. He built a prototype system, then licensed it to Magnavox, who created the first home video game console called the Magnavox Odyssey in 1972. Now, being the first console, Magnavox was very protective of this new market they had just created. Whenever another company, like Atari, brought a console to market, Magnavox sued the living hell out of them for patent infringement. Basically, Magnavox claimed a patent on various essential video game concepts like literally hitting a ball with a paddle. Nintendo, who had just brought a console to market, was sweating. Instead of just laying low, they decided to do an utterly bizarre thing and sue Magnavox before Magnavox could sue them. Nintendo's argument was that Magnavox's patents shouldn't count because they had messed up some paperwork or whatever. Specifically, Magnavox's patent said that Magnavox had invented the idea even though their lawyer had seen a demonstration of another game that had the same mechanic 11 years earlier. Like the Atari vs. Nintendo lawsuit Magnavox countersued with a no, you, the courts agreed, saying that it was absurd to expect a lawyer to remember a specific game mechanic from a decade ago that they saw once when video games hadn't even been properly invented yet. Even if this hadn't been the case, Nintendo would have still had to prove that Magnavox did this on purpose, which really isn't something you can do. Case closed, Nintendo loses. Again. If you thought Magnavox had gone patent crazy, wait till you meet Alpex. In the early 1970s, around the same time as the Magnavox Odyssey, Alpex Computer Core filed patent number 4,026,505, colloquially referred to as 555. And boy, this thing covers everything. You controlling a television image using a controller or keyboard? Sued. You using cartridges to let one system play multiple games? Sued. You rendering images on a screen by storing pixels in memory? Sued. And Alpex went after everybody. At least 70 companies. They threatened to sue unless the companies entered a non-exclusive licensing agreement for using the technology. Ironically, Magnavox was one such company, as were Mattel, Sierra Online, IBM, Atari, Activision, Commodore, Coleco, Parker Brothers, and, of course, Nintendo. Most just signed the license and moved on. Nintendo did not. The court case showed just how mind-numbingly technical a patent can be. Alpex's patent included the following. The television raster comprises numerous discrete dots or bars, approximately 32,000, which the cathode ray beam illuminates on a standard cycle, which in turn creates the image on a television screen. The patented invention requires sufficient RAM to accommodate each of the approximately 32,000 memory positions needed to represent the raster image. Thus, the RAM holds at least one bit of data for each position in the memory map of the raster. Accordingly, this video display system is called bit mapping. To which Nintendo replies, NES utilizes a patented picture processing unit or PPU to perform the generation of images on the screen. The PPU receives performed horizontal slices of data and places each slice in one of each shift registers. 
each of which can store a maximum of 8 pixels. These slices of data are then processed directly onto the screen. The PPU repeats this process to assemble the initial images on the screen. Therefore, it repeats the process as necessary to form changes in the images throughout the progression of the game. Jesus Christ. The court retorted, in fancy court terms, that the distinction was bullshit. Thus, Nintendo was ordered to pay... Two hundred million dollars. Right, so that would have pretty much killed Nintendo, so they did what all rich people in America do and appealed it. That's an option for some reason. For some people. The second court said that Alpex's patent was valid, but that Nintendo had not infringed on it, since the technology wasn't the same. Finally, Nintendo wins a patent lawsuit. Sure hope that doesn't go to their heads. Now here's an interesting one. Way back in the 1960s, years and years before video games, there was a little toy store named Louis Galoob Toys. It was a small family company that found success reintroducing the world to that monkey that plays the cymbals. From there, they moved on to remote-controlled cars, an exclusive license to make Smurf toys, and finally, the Mr. T doll. Fucking wild. They went public, made a lot of electronic toys, went through some tough times, and eventually founded their legacy when they created a line of tiny, tiny, tiny cars called Micro Machines. I'm the Micro Machine Man, and I'm waiting to be launched out of town. But first, let me tell you about another launcher, the Micro Machine's Power Launcher. With super storage for two unbelievably ultra-fast Micro Machines, simply strap it to your wrist, roll up the road, we ramp, pull back the power loader, then let her in. But the toy industry is a fickle thing, full of highs and lows, seasonal rushes, and market crashes. So to protect the company's profits, they expanded a bit into the video game market, once it existed, with a cheat cartridge called the Game Genie. Game over? No way! Because we got Game Genie! We tell you when it's over! This awesome piece of tech allowed kids to temporarily modify the game's data, doing everything from adding extra lives to accessing unused assets. Since this was fun, they knew Nintendo would hate it. So again, they sued Nintendo first, and Nintendo again said, No, you. The court prevented Louis Galoob Toys from releasing the Game Genie until after the trial. Nintendo's argument was pretty interesting. They said that since the Game Genie changed the game's code, that counted as a whole new game, i.e. a derivative work. And since Nintendo has exclusive right to, to make derivative works of their own games, the Game Genie was breaking their copyright. The judge had an alternate argument, namely that editing a game's code was no different than fast-forwarding a movie or changing the rules of a board game. It may change the game, but it sure as hell wasn't a whole new work. This ruling hurt Nintendo pretty bad. They had to pay damages to Louis Galoob Toys for all the lost sales they suffered from not being able to sell the game Genie until after the trial. Those losses, apparently, were worth $15 million. Oops. After the disaster with the Game Genie, Nintendo seemed to lose its appetite for the courtroom. If they were going to sue again, it was going to be an absolute 100% sure thing. And you can't get much more 100% sure than piracy. Their opinion, not necessarily mine. But even I have to admit, this one was sort of egregious. Bung was a Hong Kong company, producing various, quote, backup and development units, which allowed people to play games they didn't own. Especially, for our purposes, Games for the Super Nintendo N64 and Game Boy. These weren't just downloadable ROMs, by the way, they were physical pieces of hardware you had to buy. Not exactly subtle. 
Nintendo reacted as expected, leading to a complicated international set of legal battles, which Nintendo had to fight separately in the US, Europe, and Hong Kong, the US again, and then Hong Kong again, until finally joining forces with Sony and Microsoft like the Avengers of the video game console market in order to finally kill the pirate consoles for good. Those ones, anyway. Game controller with analog pressure sensor. Variable conductance sensor with elastomeric dome cap. Remote controller with analog button. Image controller with sheet connected sensors. Game control with analog pressure sensor. Variable sensor with tactile feedback. Analog controllers housed with electronic displays. Analog sensor with snap through tactile feedback. 3D controller with vibration. Sound familiar? If you said that that sounds like a list of basically every possible video game controller configuration, well, you'd be pretty damn close. At least as far as the courts are concerned. Allow me to introduce you to the concept of a patent troll. A patent troll is a shameless shell of a thing, whose whole purpose is to come up with ideas like really, really vague ideas. Patent those ideas, never make the ideas into actual products, and then sue anyone who does make those products. It's like the courtroom version of a reaction video. They don't actually make anything themselves. They just get rich off of other people doing it. Anyway, from a legal standpoint, that description is completely unrelated to this company I'm about to talk about, which is called An Escape Limited. Anescape held all the patents I mentioned before. They never made a video game controller, as far as I can tell, but they've held patents like that since the 90s. In 2006, they finally swooped in against Nintendo and Microsoft, accusing them of violating these patents. Microsoft settled out of court. Nintendo, always up to call a dumbass bluff, fought them. Good for Nintendo. Anescape had accused Nintendo of violating the patents when they made the Wii Classic Controller, Nintendo GameCube Controller, GameCube WaveBird Wireless Controller, and Wii Nunchuck Controller. Apparently, doing something like that would be worth $23 million, which the court agreed with, I don't, but what do I know? I release content for free. As you should expect by now, Nintendo immediately appealed the decision to a higher court. Their reason? Prior art. Prior art is this fancy patent term that translates roughly to you didn't invent this, someone else already did, idiot. It's the same argument that Nintendo had tried to use against Magnavox during the whole hitting a ball with a paddle thing, but in this case, they had a point. Anescape really had two main patents that were the cause of all of this mess. One was from 1996 and one was from 2000. The 1996 patent was specifically for a controller with one input, like a joystick or a trackball. The 2000 patent went wild with a concept for a two-input controller. Something like, I don't know, the PlayStation DualShock controller. By the way, when did the PlayStation DualShock controller come out? Oh, will you look at that. Said higher court reversed the original decision since Sony's DualShock patent clearly predated Anescape's 2001 and their 1996 one was specifically for a single input which didn't count, but nice try. And so Nintendo survives another day and can finally sell those controllers again. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kinda getting into all this dumb lawyer shit. I am not a biologist. But eyes are weird, right? Like, each eye can only see a 2D image of the world. Think of it like a photograph. Width and height, but no depth. 
But this weird thing happens when you take two of those 2D images and superimpose them. If they were stacked perfectly, you'd still see only one image, but our eyes are separated, so they actually see from two slightly different angles. And when those two photos overlap a bit, the difference in those angles allows our brain to understand the difference between points in those images. Depth. Now, if you wanted to create this effect on purpose for something like a movie or a game, well, that's kind of difficult. Those are only shown on flat planes. A movie is just one flat image. To get 3D, you'd have to have two images at different angles. The cool way we usually do this is by having a movie layered with two images, each recorded at a slightly different angle, usually by two different cameras at the same time. Then, either using color glasses or polarized lenses, making the viewer only able to see one image with one eye. Ta-da! Magic. It's 3D. Now, Nintendo loved 3D. They had been experimenting with it since the 80s, even before the Virtual Boy console. But they had never gotten it commercially viable. But what if the problem wasn't the idea, but the execution? What if 3D would work, but only if you didn't need the headset or special glasses? Well, in 2010, that's the bet that Nintendo went for when they released their bold new portable console called the 3DS. The 3DS was able to create 3D game images and 3D augmented reality images using two internal cameras, which you could strengthen, weaken, or even turn off completely with a neat little slider on the side. Real quick, no reason or anything, but let's talk about something called structural equivalence. Structural equivalence is another fancy lawyer phrase. This one means that even if you don't technically infringe on a patent, you can still get sued if your original idea does the same thing as a patent while specifically doing it in the same way. You didn't make the same product, but you sorta made the same product, kind of, if you think about it that way, which I guess is what Tomita Technologies did. Tomita is a Japanese company founded by an ex-Sony engineer who went on to research and invent a bunch of patents. As far as I can tell, they aren't a patent troll because they actually do work on 3D and AR technology. They just happen to hyper-focus on it. So of course, like you do, they hold a lot of patents for the things they're working on. One such things they're working on was a method of producing 3D images without glasses. Oh no. Now, Tomito wasn't saying that the 3DS infringed on their patent because it was the same product, but because it fell into that sketchy structural equivalence domain. 3D without glasses? That's fine. One image made using two cameras? No problem. But you fools, you put a depth slider on it. The strength of a 3D effect can cause what the patent calls stereoscopic feelings. That is the sort of headachey, sicknessy thing that we all got from the 3DS. Tomita's patent includes a way to compensate for this, allowing the viewer to adjust the strength of the 3D effect. Pretty damning stuff. Nintendo loses for $30 million in damages. Nintendo, in a post-trial motion, calls bullshit. The 3DS sold at a loss, after all, and the lawsuit centered on the cameras anyway, which most games didn't even use. No way in hell was that worth $30 million. The court agreed and cut the fine in half. Not enough. Both Nintendo and Tomita appealed again. During the appeal, the court realizes that the whole case was hanging on one complicated concept, that of the offset presetting means. 
and that no one in the original case had any clear idea what the hell that actually was, including Nintendo and Tomita. After finally figuring it out, the appealed case decided that the 3DS actually didn't handle the 3D strength in the same way that Tomita's patent did, so the 3DS didn't count as structural equivalence after all. Decision reversed. Tomita tried one last time, petitioning the Supreme Court to view the case, but they refused. All of that took seven years. The legal system is balls. Okay, this one's actually hilarious. So, Recognicore has this patent for method and apparatus for encoding decoding image data. It's all about this clever way of compressing and transmitting face data without losing quality. Their method encoded an image into several memory-efficient pieces so they would take up less space when they were sent somewhere else. Anyway, Recognicore sues Nintendo for patent infringement, which I guess is just what everybody does. Specifically, the accusation centered around the Nintendo Mii characters, and how Nintendo had encoded the face data for them. Unfortunately for Recognicore, they never even got a chance to argue about Nintendo. The judge ruled that Recognicore's idea wasn't even specific enough to be a patent in the first place, so the court invalidated it. Not only did they lose the case, they lost the damn patent too. You might have heard about this one. This is about motion control tracking for body motion. Specifically, a medical tech firm called iLife held some patents for using accelerometers to track body parts relative to the ground. They accused Nintendo of infringing on six of those patents in games like Wii Sports. Nintendo, having just learned from their battle with Recognicore, opened right away by asserting that the patent ideas were too abstract to be patents. A lot of drama in this one. The court agreed that five of the patents were too abstract, but the last, however, was valid, so the case continued. Nintendo couldn't really deny infringing the patent, since their original defense was that the patent wasn't enforceable when they broke it so they lose the case for $10 million. During the inevitable appeal, however, the higher court struck down that final patent as well. Nintendo is safe again because patent law is complicated and no one seems to know what the hell is going on. iLife also tried to get the Supreme Court involved, but the SC don't give a shit. Around the same time as the iLife lawsuit, Philips conducted a similar motion tracking lawsuit of its own. Well, four lawsuits. In four countries. They specifically wanted to defend patents for interactive virtual modeling products, and motion controls like those of the Nintendo Wii and Wii U controllers and peripherals. Apparently, they had reached out to Nintendo years earlier to offer a licensing deal for the tech, but when Nintendo refused, Philips took it to the courts. Lots of courts. The fact that Nintendo had been warned about the infringement by Philips was pretty damning. Nintendo lost the cases quickly in Germany and the UK, and it wasn't looking too good in the US either. With their backs against the legal wall, Nintendo buckled, agreeing to pay an unknown license fee to Philips in order to keep selling the Wii and Wii U. Boy, if you thought you hated patent law before, just try to make a YouTube video about it. I can feel my eyes bleeding. Quintal Research Group owns a patent for a quote, portable handheld communication device for rapid retrieval of computerized information. It's rectangular, has a screen, and more importantly, a pair of thumb controls on either side. 
You've probably already caught on that this would include the Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS variations, and even the Nintendo Switch if it had been released yet. The problem is, the patent specifies that the controls need to be symmetrical, and they just... they aren't. Quintal argued that by symmetrical, they meant the location of the buttons, not the arrangement of the buttons. Nice try, but no. The court literally consulted dictionaries to compare definitions of the word symmetry. Dictionaries as in plural. Law is weird. In the end, the case didn't even go to a full trial. Let this be a lesson to all you potential patent purchasers out there. A single word can fuck up your whole argument. In which Nintendo continues its tyrannical campaign against fun. Okay, actually I'm kind of on their side for this one, but I don't like it. Mari Car was a go-kart tour company renting out street-legal go-karts for customers to drive around Tokyo, Osaka, and Okinawa. They even rented out Nintendo character costumes for you to wear. Honestly, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Nintendo claimed that the fun, enjoyable activity that made people happy was a blatant rip-off of their trademark. Specifically, that the name Mari Car could be confused for Mario Kart, and like, yeah, but I don't care. Do you? The Japan Patent Office didn't care either. They dismissed Nintendo's claim right away. When that didn't work, Nintendo sued Mari Car for renting out the costumes and using them for advertising without permission. And that's the part that's kind of fair. After all, it's probably damaging to the Nintendo brand to see Luigi jump a sidewalk into a fish and chip shop, a thing that actually happened, by the way. Nintendo wins the copyright claim easily and drives away with a cool 90,000 USD. Mari Car still exists, but they had to rebrand as Street Cart. You can still rent out other costumes like superheroes and such, but no Nintendo ones. We're deep in the 2010s now, and we finally arrived at the current console generation. I have obtained a patent for hitting the like button, but feel free to infringe upon it as we continue. Game Vice is a California-based company focusing on detachable video game peripherals for smartphones. For example, something like this. It's a pretty neat idea for making mobile games feel more like good games. Sorry, I just really like controllers. Game Vice accused Nintendo of infringing on their patents with the Nintendo Switch, and okay, sure. There's a resemblance. Worth a shot. So Game Vice files a lawsuit in August of 2017. Two months later, they change their mind and dismiss it themselves. Five months after that, now in 2018, they send out a second lawsuit, but for different patents. This time, they even get the International Trade Commission involved in order to block Nintendo Switches from being sold in the U.S. What follows is like the Boss Rush version of the dictionary fiasco from earlier. Nintendo and Game Vice lead the court through pedantic definitions of the following terms that read like song titles from a cybernetic Christmas album. Computing device. Retention mechanism. Fastening mechanisms. A pair of confinement structures. Passageway. Communication link. Structural bridge. Promotes. Electrical communication. And the similar but distinct electronic communication. By now, you can probably see where this is going. The Nintendo Switch controllers are very similar, but with some very major differences. Specifically, the Game Vice device is one piece that's held together. The Switch Joy-Cons are separate and can be used without being attached. A small difference to us, maybe, but a huge difference to a patent. 
unsurprisingly, Nintendo wins. This one is a bit harder to find first-hand information on, probably because it was between two Japanese companies and I can't read Japanese court documents. But there is another YouTube video about it if you'd like to dive into some more details. The company in question is Kalapla, who created a free-to-play mobile game called The White Cat Project. Nintendo accused them of infringing on six Japanese patents, including things like automatically attacking enemies when you stop touching the screen, asking the player to confirm before coming out of sleep mode, and joystick-type motion controls on a touchscreen. In preparation for a coming lawsuit, Nintendo changed the language of the patents to be more specific, which is apparently an option. Once they were happy that the language would include games like White Cat Project, Nintendo reached out to Kalopla through informal means. When those attempts were rebuffed, they went the lawsuit route instead. Kalopla argued that Nintendo's patents were too broad to be enforceable, but that argument no longer worked because they had updated the language of the patents. Once the court case started, Nintendo asked for around 40 million USD, then steadily increased that number as the case went on, complaining that Kalopla was still using the potentially patent-infringing tech while the trial was happening. After they finally raised the request to 88 million USD, Kalopla gave up and settled out of court for 30 million. I am told this is totally not bully behavior. Sometimes... The world just works. Whether it's fate, statistics, or a joke of the universe, some things just align to form a coincidence so absurd that it could only happen in real life. Our last Nintendo lawsuit pits Nintendo against its greatest nemesis, Bowser. Specifically, Gary Bowser. That's right, for our final case, Nintendo didn't sue a company or a group, it sued a person. And it utterly ruined his life. Gary Bowser is a 54-year-old programmer suffering from chronic pain. He is also, unfortunately for him, the face of Nintendo piracy, specifically Team Executor and their piracy hardware, that lets users play ROMs on their Switch. According to him, he was the middleman between the device programmers and the device testers, two groups who lacked all social skills, which he had plenty of. He also managed their website. That's it. He didn't develop the hardware or the software, and he didn't pirate anything himself. He didn't sell it to the public. He just told customers where to go. For this sin, Nintendo sued him twice. He didn't fight it. He was sentenced to 40 months in prison and ordered to pay Nintendo $14.5 million. Now that he's released, he will spend the rest of his life sending Nintendo 20 to 30% of his income. But they were kind, and only count the percentage that's left over after food and rent. They are proud of this. Let this be your reminder. Corporations are not, have not ever been, and will never be good. Even the ones you trust even the ones who occasionally do good things. Every one of them will gladly ruin your life if they think it will earn them a few dollars. And then, they will celebrate. According to the Justice Department, Team Executor, the whole group, not just Bowser, cost their victims, all their victims, not just Nintendo, 
$65 million. Nintendo is worth $61 billion. Piracy doesn't seem to be hurting them too bad. Aside from Gary Bowser, Nintendo has aggressively attacked ROM sites, piracy, emulators, fan projects, fan games, and anything and seemingly everything else their fans have done. I don't really feel like listing all those out, partially because so many of them end in NDAs, and also because it puts me in a bad mood. So in the interest of my sanity as well as yours, I think I'll just end the video here. Nintendo has had quite the history of defending its patents and infringing on the patents of others, with several examples of copyright and trademark thrown in to keep things interesting. I guess this is the cost of being the company known for innovation and marketable IPs. I really want to respect them for that, and maybe I should. But it just kills me a bit every time they go after the little guys who are just trying to celebrate their love of the games. Hell, my tattoo is probably trademark infringement. Maybe they'll sue me one day to have it removed. After researching all these cases, it wouldn't really surprise me. Anyway, sorry for the downer ending. My other videos usually end better than this, so be sure to check those out and subscribe if you want. Also, let me know in the comments which lawsuit was the most interesting to you. It'll give us all something to do while we wait to see how this Pal World thing goes.